We're going to turn again to the book of Exodus this morning. It's our 17th week in this series, walking through the book of Exodus. And the title of our message this morning is a somewhat paradoxical title, but you'll understand it more by the end of this sermon. The, the title of our message this morning is Stand Firm and Go Forward. Stand Firm and Go Forward. Now, my last sermon in this series, two weeks ago, after Reed shared last week, uh, which was a wonderful message, thank you for, for doing that, Reed. Two weeks ago, when we were back here in the book of Exodus, again, we, we left the people of God as they were encamped by the Red Sea, right? We've been walking through this story, a story that's familiar, at least in the broad strokes, to many of us. And the people had reached the edge of the Red Sea. The Lord's been leading them. He told them, encamp here in this particular place, settle in, even face a certain direction, and be ready for Pharaoh, the enemy who has been in conflict with God throughout all the plagues, all this time that we've been looking at. His heart will once again be hardened. He's coming in defiance of what I have said to let my people go. He comes once again. And so we ended two weeks ago in the text with this summary of the response of the people of God. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. Now, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. The people of Israel cried out to Yahweh. They said to Moses, is this because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Just leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been far better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. <laughs> so this moment of fear on the part of the Israelites just overshadows everything they've witnessed up to this point, right? They've seen God work in amazing, mighty, powerful ways, led them to be exactly where they are. And in this moment, the fear of here comes the Egyptian army, they go, it's all over, we're going to die. And so we said last week, the issue was for them, the same issue that you and I face. It was the conflict that we all are challenged with, the, the conflict between faith and fear. The people, amazingly here, are being led personally and literally by God to be exactly where they are. A pillar of cloud by day guided them to where to go. A pillar of fire by night that they could see the presence of God with them. And God told them exactly where to camp, exactly which direction to face. And, and even the fact that Pharaoh was coming, they knew all of this from the word of God. And yet, when they looked up and saw the enemies on the horizon, fear was their response, not faith. And so we pick back up in this moment as they're camped right here, fearful, wondering what's going to happen, and we see and hear a powerful response given to the people from God through Moses. Look at verses 13 and 14 this morning. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Yahweh will fight for you. You have only to be silent. <laughs> now this right here is the crucial word to God's people in every situation of fear. This is what we need to get. The big idea today that we need to hear. Every single one of us, no matter what things we are facing that may produce fear in us, no matter what enemies may be on the horizon that we see, this is the word for us today to hear, to push deep down into our hearts so that we can draw it out in the times of life that we will face fearful circumstances, which are coming for all of us, right? No matter how courageous you may put on on the outside, you still face fearful situations. There's still things that scare you. There's still things that should scare you. But in those moments, this is what we need to draw out. And so this is what we need to be pushing in into our hearts today as we sit here and hear this from the word of God. You and I, we are called to stand firmly and fearlessly in faith of the God who speaks and saves. We are called to stand firmly and fearlessly in faith of the God who speaks and saves. See, what God tells the people here through Moses is that God is the one who's going to fight the battle and win the battle. And the people are going to receive salvation. But it's God who's going to win. They don't need to win the battle. They don't need to earn it. They don't need to do something in those moments to deserve it. They need to be silent and watch their God win the battle and give them the reward of victory. 
So the battle here in Exodus 14, just like all the conflict that we've seen up to this point, really isn't a battle between the Egyptian nation and the nation of Israel. It's a battle between the enemies of God and God himself. The people don't need to fight in this. They left Egypt. You remember two weeks ago we said they left Egypt equipped for battle, but God didn't take them north, the fastest route to the promised land, because he knew what? They weren't ready for war. They weren't ready to fight. And nothing's changed by the time they're encamped south of that near the Red Sea. They're still not ready for a battle. So God does not call them to battle. He does not call them to arms. He does not say, all right, we're going to win. I'm going to empower your soldiers. I'm going to teach you new battle techniques. No, he says, be silent. I will win, and I will give you the victory. All they're told to do is stand firm upon the promise and power of God. Stand firm in faith and reliance upon God. So again, over and over in this series, it's been the the key theme I keep bringing out over and over again to you is that we need to see God not only has power, which he's demonstrated time and time again in all of the plagues, amazing acts of sovereign power that cannot be explained any other way, but we've also been tracking how often we see God tell the people what is about to happen and then him do exactly what he said he would do. He's been faithful. His word has been true. He's proven himself reliable time and time again. And understanding that really is what you and I must draw out of the narrative of Exodus, that God is faithful. He is trustworthy. His words are true, and we need to stand firm upon them because this is the key issue that's under attack in every single age is if we will trust the words of God or not. Here in Exodus 14, that's what's under attack. It's the question that's put in the minds and the hearts of the people. And the problem is, it's not a settled question for them. It's a thing they're wrestling with. They're asking the question of doubt, of faithlessness. Is God's word true? Can we trust what God said? He promised deliverance. He promised we would leave Egypt. We would reach the mountain and worship him there. He's told us of a promised land that he will plant us in. But is his word true? Can we rely on him? Can we trust God's words? God tells his people they must stand firm upon his word, upon his promises, and believe that what he says is always true and sure. It's always right. He's never wrong. He's not been wrong one single time in the narrative of Exodus, has he? When he said, here's what I will do, here's how Pharaoh will respond, never once did we see Pharaoh do something different than what God said was going to happen. He was in control of all of it, every single moment. And for you and I, just like it was for the Israelites, knowing and believing this, that God is trustworthy, God is true, he never lies, he's never wrong, there's never a moment when God's not in control. He never steps away for just a little bit and some stuff happens. He comes back to see what just took place. He's always in control. That is the basis for rightly understanding and responding to this world that we live in. Not just in Exodus, not just encamped by the Red Sea, but here today, right now, in our own lives. This is the foundation that we need to stand upon. This truth, this reality of who God is and what God says. It's the only way you and I are going to be able to sort through this insane cultural rebellion that we see playing out in the world all around us. This is really practical, believing this. It really should impact how we live. If we believe that God is trustworthy, his word is true, and then we live in that belief day by day, it will change how we respond to this world, how we navigate this world, how we think and interact with others in our daily lives. If we believe, not just intellectually, not just I'm going to say it and you're going to go amen and nod, but if you really believe it when you leave this room, that the word of God here is theonoustos, God breathed. It is the highest authority. It's infallible, inerrant, the inspired words of God. Him speaking to us through this book. If you really believe that and you live like that's true, your life will look different. This is one of the most important things I want to impress upon you as your pastor. It's this. It's this key truth. I want you to know this. I want you to believe this. I want you to live in light of this. 
a firm commitment to the word of God, belief that what he says in the scriptures is true. I want our young people like Casey, as he prepares to head to college, to be grounded firmly on this foundation. I want this deep in your soul. I want this to be ever present in your mind as you navigate this next season of life. Because here's the reality. Casey, over the next several years, you're going to go to a school to learn a skill set, to be educated in a career path. But what you're going to find is you're going to have fellow students, you're going to have faculty, you're going to have staff and administration who don't believe in this at all. You're going to be surrounded by people who reject the word of God, reject who he says he is, reject what he says is true, who reject the commands that he puts upon people. You're going to be surrounded by that. But rather than us saying, oh, then Casey, you shouldn't go, just stay here, stay, stay up in, in Nelsonville in Philadelphia and Palmyra, we'll keep you safe. No, we want you to go, but we want you to go built firmly upon this foundation. If you go and you are grounded in the word of God, if you're reading, you take, take the reading plan, grab the new ones when they come out on the website, right? Read the devotion that, that you have. Get in the word of God, get grounded in the word of God and be a light where you're going. This is the mission. This is the goal. We're sending you out with everything you need in the word of God to be a witness there. This is, this is what we're trying to build. This is what we're trying to do here. This is not just let's come together at church every week because that's a good tradition. No, this is like, those of you who are educators, this is like at the start of the year, you've got a plan, right? You know what your students have to learn by the end of the year. I'm not looking at just one year as your pastor. I'm looking at your life. I'm looking at young people going off to college and going, what do they need to get equipped there? And so every week is a part of that. Every week's a building block of that. That's why you need to come. That's why we need to grow. That's why we need to invest. That's why we need to put the energy and the time in here. Because we're building something. We're preparing for real life. I'm trying to develop this commitment that we would be people who stand firm upon the word of God. It really has been a passion and a central focus of of my ministry for a long time, over a decade now of of formal pastoral ministry. This has been the the heartbeat of what I'm trying to do. And that's not just words. You can actually verify that today. You have a great opportunity to, to find out if that's true because we have a young lady visiting us here. This is Savannah. You can kind of wave. This is Savannah over here. We've known Savannah for over a decade now, over 10 years Back to when Malia and I first started Evangel Temple, the church that we were serving before we came here, she was eight years old at that point in time, started coming to kids' church as we were leading that week in and week out. Now she's going off to college as well in just a few days. On Wednesday, she moves in to college, she's going to study to be an accountant. And I'm like, how's that possible with this little eight-year-old girl? Like, I look at her and I still see the eight-year-old savvy that we met a decade ago. This one here. Go ahead and put the picture. This one of my favorite photos of her. Ah. Look how young she is and how young Malia is. Everybody's so young. Ten years, you know, she had the short hair. That's a whole other story for another time. This is who I look at. I look at her and I'm like, that's, that's, that's savvy. But no, here she is ten years later, headed off to college, going to be an accountant, get her, you know, CPA, the whole thing. And I'm like, what, what has happened, right? Now, so I don't get in trouble for just showing um, old pictures of them. Uh, here, you put the next photo. So this is me ten years ago with a whole group of kids, including Savvy. Yeah, I didn't have the, the beard going on uh, at that point. Still have my dress shirts, though, you know. Um, there's a whole group of kids, a whole group of ET kids that we had. This is not nearly all of what we had in kids' church. This photo is actually from a day that all those kids pictured right there got baptized. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Over 10 years ago. Whew. I'm showing these, though, because it's not just a trip down memory lane, as fun as that is. Way back then, with this group of kids that now are all like Savannah, and they're finishing high school, they're heading to college. Some of them are already in college. A few of them are getting married, which is just crazy to think about. This group of kids, when we were leading them at eight, nine, how many ever years old they were, we thought the most important thing we need to do, well, it's not just make kids' church fun. I mean, it's a bright orange wall behind us. We have balloons. You know, it's a fun room, but you know, the most important thing is we need to get them to know who God is and know the Word of God. And so that's what we worked at doing every single week in that kids' church room with the bright orange wall behind us. We had church. 
we gathered in Kids Church for us. It was an hour and a half uh, service in the main service and in Kids Church. And so we, we gathered every single week, and we had church. We took up tithes and offerings. We sang. We had worship time. We had prayer time, and we had a sermon. Uh, and so here's another photo of me. This is uh, right around the time I still have that sweater, which I love. <laughs> Gives me such great joy, embarrasses Malia to no extent. She's like, get rid of your stuff. I'm like, I expect my sweaters to last a decade. And it has. It's awesome. So here's me. This is, this is me preaching in the, in the kids' church room right about that same time, just a few weeks from those other two photos. You can't read the text behind. That's, that's a text from 1 Corinthians. It's up there on the screen. And I'm preaching what was very likely a 25 to 30-minute sermon because that's what we did in kids' church. Like we got up there, we preached the word of God, and we had altar time, and we prayed, and we responded because we wanted these kids to know this is, this is the Christian life. This is the most important thing you're ever going to know is what's in the word of God. Yeah. And so that's what we did. She can testify. That's what we did week in and week out, didn't we? And I think it worked. A lot of those kids from that previous picture, like I said, they're heading off to college. Some of them are getting married. They're walking with the Lord. They're growing in their faith day by day. They're like Savannah. Who wants to come? I mean, what, what kid getting ready to go to school in three days? Her birthday's even Tuesday. So this, is, this could be a whole big celebration weekend for her. What does she want to do? She wants to come see us and come to church with us. They're walking with God because we put the word of God as the center point of their faith. And that's what works. That's what changes lives. I have a letter from you. I don't know if you remember this. She wrote several very sweet letters. She's a very sweet girl. She's very artistically talented too. And she wrote several very nice letters to Malia and I over the years. And I have two letters from you that are in not this Bible. They're in my, my brown Bible that's over at the house that I have kept in that Bible ever since you gave them to me, thanking me for teaching the Word of God. And you were maybe 10 or 11 when you wrote those letters. And I've kept them to this day because she understood at 10 or 11 how important I thought this thing was, and she wanted to thank me for doing that. Okay, I'm going to cry <laughs> if we keep talking about it. Look, this is the thing that we're aiming for, is building this foundation in the lives of our kids, of our youth. As, she, as our missionary said, she said, hey, take your kids to youth group. Get them involved in youth ministry. And the same is true of kids' ministry. These are not just things we do because, well, churches do them. These are intentional things that we have in place. They're places we're intentionally putting resources in the church because these things matter. So parents, make sure your kids are coming. <laughs> you got a role to play. The central thing that, that every one of us needs to grasp, the central thing, not, it's not just for Casey, it's not just for Savannah as they head off to college, the central thing for us to know is that we need to be knowing God and his word spoken to us through scripture. It is crucial for everyone of us to get that deep into our souls right now. It's not just a preparation for college thing. This is preparation for life truth right here. If this foundational conviction of what the word of God is, if you do not believe that God is true and that his truth is spoken to us in scripture, if that conviction is weak in you, no one of us, whether we're going to college or to our jobs or we're in retirement, none of us will stand firm in the faith very long if this conviction is weak. If this foundational belief that God speaks objectively and truly through the scriptures alone as the highest authority is misplaced, if it becomes subjected or subverted underneath something else, underneath our experiences, our feelings, or traditions, or habits, or anything else, if it's not the primary thing in our walk with Jesus that this is where we go to meet with God, we won't last. You will not live faithfully as a follower of God very long. This is the foundation. No other foundation will stand up to life. No other foundation will remain firm. Only the word of God. If this foundational belief that God is true, that his words in scripture are reliable, is not your highest commitment, then you are going to struggle, as so many people are struggling right now with the arguments of this world, caving into ungodly, destructive teachings. This is why, because the word of God has not been placed as the foundation for somebody, this is why people give in to the teachings of our culture that say gender identity is fluid, just a scale, move along it as you like. If this isn't your highest commitment, then you'll be swayed by the culture arguments which are so loud and prevalent today that sexual expression, it's all equally moral, it's all good, we should celebrate all of it. No matter who you love, how you want to love them, it's all fine. Oh, 
or most tragic to me, is that we'll accept the very loud rationale of our world that says, hey, it's a good thing for us to encourage and provide for and celebrate the mutilization of bodies in this so-called transition from male to female, female to male, whatever. And our culture says, that's great, we should celebrate that, we should encourage that, we should let that happen, and we're watching all these lives be destroyed. They are destroyed. The body is mutilated after these procedures. But our culture says these are all good things, and so many people are caving into that. Why? Ultimately, why? Because they're not grounded on the Word of God. Because they're not standing firm here. They're not looking at Genesis 1, 2, 3. God created them as he created them. Male, female, that's God's design. He doesn't make mistakes. This is why many people in our society are buying into the claims of our culture. Two men or two women can enter into a marriage. Because they think we can define that. We can, we can claim and, and create this contract of marriage however we deem fit instead of saying, no, this is a covenant defined by God. See, the only way to stand firm to these things is to be firm on the word of God. We must believe all that he says and all that he promises. This is true in every single generation. The challenges we face are just different in the different moments that we live in. So quickly, let's turn and look at what happens next in Exodus 14. Otherwise, we won't get through all the text today. And then I have a second point I want us to see. Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 to 18. Here's what we read. So Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel, Go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So the first thing God says, point one this morning, is this. We need to stand firm upon what God has said. He's told them what's going to happen. He's promised them deliverance. He's given his word. They need to stand firm on his word and go forward in faith and obedience. Not just enough to say, yeah, oh, I believe you. I believe you, God. They have to live like they believe that to be true, which in this case means crossing a sea. So we read in verses 19 to 21. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillars of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So, so notice this, because... We just have to see what's happening here. God moves the pillar from in front of them. He's been leading them, guiding them to right where he wants to be. Now he moves it behind them, showing God not only leads and guides his people, but he protects them too, right? So the pillar's behind him. He separates them from the Egyptian army. But notice the detail there in verse 21 that so often I think we miss. Perhaps maybe you heard this uh, wrong when you, when you got this in a storybook Bible or Sunday school lesson. Maybe you didn't notice the detail there. How did God part the sea? Or specifically, how long did God take to part the sea. Verse 21 says, Yahweh drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. See, like so much of God's work in our lives, it wasn't an immediate thing that he did. I mean, he could have, of course. He could have said, Moses, raised the staff and all the water in that whole segment just evaporates, the ground's dry, and here we go, marching across, right? And that's kind of how we sometimes envision the story playing out. That's not what took place. The text is very clear to tell us. He sends a strong east wind that lasts all night. So think about how uncomfortable the waiting period had to have been for the Israelites, who are fearful, who are already doubting God, who aren't quite sure if they can stand firm on his word. Imagine their feeling, hearing a powerful wind on one side of them, so strong that it can move the waters of the sea, blowing on one side, and on the other side of the cloud where they can't see them but can hear there are the Egyptians just waiting for an opening to come through and attack and slaughter them all. And that's not just a few minutes, it's all night long. That's the period of waiting. That's the period of, of waiting to see God fulfill his word. And that's typical of how God works. Not how we wish he worked all the time, right? 
But he works through seasons that are much longer than we want, often through difficult seasons, through drawn-out periods of hardship, through times of long waiting where we think, God, you know, could, we, could, we could move this along. <laughs> Be a little more efficient. Let's get there. He works through situations that sometimes we don't like. So again, if we're going to apply these truths to, to our current day, let me, let me help us do that to our lives right now. Understand this morning, God's working through the fact that we have a culture that is in abject rebellion to him. As uncomfortable as that is for us. We don't like this period with enemies all around us. With deliverance promised, but we don't know quite how that's going to happen. We can't see it yet. Yet God's working in this moment. As much as we look around and see things that should concern us, that cause us to fear, maybe make us angry or disheartened, hear me. God is still at work. His word is still perfect and true. God's working through the fact that we do have governmental leaders in our own country and all around this world who are dead set on making evil policies and practices the normal in our world. That's not a surprise to God. And more amazingly, it's actually part of his perfect plan that's unfolding. What was intended, what is intended even in this moment for evil by evil people can and will be used by God for good ultimately. He will never fail to bring his plans to pass, to accomplish his perfect will, to save his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, to glorify himself for all eternity. That's never a threat of failure for him. So, so I love that Brianna shared a little bit of her, her story. It includes a long period of waiting and preparation. How, how, how fitting. And not all of that time was bad or uncomfortable for you, I'm sure. You said you really loved your job. That was great. But it was 19 years, if I'm right, from your initial call to right now when she's finally getting to go. That's a long period of waiting. And yet, she would be the first to tell you, as she did share, God used that whole period to train and develop and resource and equip her for this lifetime of ministry that's ahead of her. To go and be a part of the mission of spreading the gospel to all tribes, tongues, languages, and nations. He used the whole season of waiting for her. And she trusts and believes that. Not just, okay, God, you've worked in the past, but that you're at work right now. Because let me tell you, itinerating during COVID-19 and the aftermath of all this, it's not an easy time. Fundraising's difficult when churches are often cutting budget. And yet she believes God will be true to his word. And if he's called her to go and proclaim the gospel on the other side of the world in Africa, he's going to make a way. And his plan will not fail. God will not fail. He never stops working. The timing and his plans, they just may not be ours, but hear me, his ways are so much better. They are perfect. And anytime we can't see that or feel that, all that exposes is our own limitations and our own imperfections, not his. He's the same. He's in control. So we read then in Exodus 14, that in the morning, after the night of waiting, the long period of waiting and the uncomfortableness of that, The people of Israel in the morning went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, and in the morning watch, Yahweh, in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, they're realizing what's happening, let us flee from before Israel, for Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. And then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, Yahweh threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all of the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel had walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that Yahweh used against the Egyptians. So the people feared Yahweh and believed in Yahweh and his servant Moses. There's a lot. Here we explore all this details, but we 
don't have time today. So I want to just note this again for us this morning. God did exactly what he had promised he would do. And here it is. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt is finally brought to pass. The promise that unfolded over all that time, finally fulfilled. They are delivered. There is no more Egyptian threat. The soldiers, the powerful army that came after them, they're all dead on the seashore. So what this means is those hundreds of years in slavery in Egypt, God was using all of that. Literally, generations of waiting for the fulfillment of the promise, because the promise didn't come first to Moses, right? We looked at this in the series. The promise was given to Abraham. Your people will be in exile for 400 years. They will become slaves, yet I will deliver them. The generations that waited for the fulfillment of that promise, that was by God's hand. He was working in all that time. He was using that time to grow his people. Because... Hopefully you understand this. Times of waiting are actually necessary for growth. I mean, physically, that's true. Everything we put in the garden or in the field, right? They take time to grow. (laughs) There's no real shortcut around that. For something to grow, time is required. And God used this time of waiting, these generations of waiting, to grow his people. And he used those years of slavery to teach his people about the cost of sin and what life apart from him is really like. See, throughout the whole Bible, they're, they're going to look back to Exodus as this, this amazing moment of God's deliverance. It's the focal point of the Israelite religion for a long time. The way we look back to the cross is the way the Jew would look back to the Exodus, to see deliverance, to see salvation. And throughout the Bible, God tells his people, you remember the time of slavery in Egypt? That is what sin is like. That's, it's slavery, it's toil, it's pain, it leads to death. You need salvation from sin the way you needed salvation from Egypt. It's the best illustration. And when God spoke clearly to Moses time and time again, as we've looked at throughout this series, he demonstrated he is the perfect sovereign God in control and knowledge. He has perfect knowledge of all things. Nothing surprises him. Nothing's outside his power. He works through the ten powerful plagues to demonstrate he is truly the only one who's sovereign. He has might over all idols, over all human powers. Nobody, nothing can stand against him. He uses the time in Exodus to demonstrate his personal and particular love for his people as he provides for them and protects them throughout the plagues. He uses all these things that we've looked at in the book of Exodus to teach his people, not just in that day, but now us who read of these things in the scriptures, in the word of God now, so that we would learn to believe and obey God even when we don't understand, even when the plan's different than our plan, even when the waiting's really difficult. God calls us to stand firm upon the truth of who he is and what he says and to go forward in faith and obedience every day of our lives. The Exodus story is not just historical. It's practical for us. It should press on our hearts as we go through these texts. It should stir up our faith. It should challenge our lives. It should motivate our obedience today. So what I want us to do in these moments we have now is to consider our own lives We've seen the failing and the flaws of the Israelites. We can look at that coolly and objectively from our pews today. You are there. God led you there. How could you be fearful, right? We can be judgmental of them and see their mistakes. But much more important for us today is to look at our own hearts and examine our own fears and our own responses to fear today in our life. To ask ourselves seriously the question, which only you and God can answer this morning, are you standing firm? Upon the word of God? Do you really believe? Personally, you have to answer this. No show of hands. We don't need anyone sharing that with anyone else. Just ask yourself this. Think about this. Ask the Lord to help you honestly answer this. Do you really believe that he speaks, that he is truth, that his words in the scripture are infallible and inerrant and fully trustworthy? And if you do believe that, ask yourself then, am I living consistent with that belief? Do you read the Bible? as if it's really, truly the words of God? Do you subject all things to Scripture? Do you take what you're hearing in the world around you and say, what does God say about that in the Word? Do you let Him shape your worldview and your daily actions and the goals you're trying to accomplish with your life? Is that coming from somewhere else or is that coming from the Word of God? 
And then the second set of questions, the second point of the text today is God told his people to go forward in faith and obedience, to stand firm upon the word, upon the truth of who he is and what he says and rely upon that, but then live like that's true. So are you doing that in your life today? Are you moving forward in your faith? Are you growing? Are you deepening in your relationship with God? Are you repenting of your sins, putting to death those things, that, those evil things that we struggle with? All of us have them. Are you putting them to death and coming alive in godliness? Are you growing? Are you wanting to move forward with the people of God around you? In this church here, ask yourself, are you wanting to grow and change and work towards accomplishing the mission that God has put before us as a people? In obedience to this command to go forward? Or are you like the Israelites who will demonstrate very quickly after this, they just want to go back to the things they already know. The unknown of walking in faith and moving forward is scarier to them than the suffering and the hardships that are behind them because at least they know what to expect. So are you content and complacent in your own life? Do you want to stay right where you are because things are more comfortable, maybe enjoyable even, this moment that you're in? Or do you even want to go back to the old things behind us instead of move forward into the scary unknown of walking forward in faith because the command wasn't stand firm on the word of God and long for the good old days. The command was stand firm upon the word of God now go forward in faith and obedience. So the Exodus story is this grand story of God's deliverance, his salvation of his people. And yet it's only this foreshadow of the greatest salvation that comes, that we know. We don't just look back to the Exodus. We look back to the fullness of salvation from sin through Jesus Christ, who came to deliver his people, to die in our place, to give us what we don't deserve. He won the battle. We don't have to. When we trust in him and when we follow him, everything changes. We're not our own. We're his. He leads. He commands we are told to trust and obey. Worship team, if you'll come this morning for our final song, I've given you a lot of serious and important questions to wrestle with and work through with God right now in our response time. And our song today is going to be really short, really simple today. So what that means is you don't have a moment to waste now. You need to press in, in prayer right now. Ask yourself these questions. Ask God through his Holy Spirit to convict you and work in you because these moments are going to pass very, very quickly. But you need to respond to the Lord and let him apply this word to your life right now. And when these moments are passed, we're going to have one more act of, of celebration to do, so we're not going to rush off. But I don't want us to miss these few moments to at least resolve in here and feel the Spirit at work in us that, that maybe there are some, some deeper things we've got to work through and some more time we need to spend on this. But I don't want us to miss this moment to feel the, wor- the Lord apply his word to us. So we're going to sing. The altars are open here. I'd love to pray with you or for you. Again, these moments will go fast, so don't wait as we sing a song all of us know, Jesus loves me. Let's respond to the Lord. It is a simple confession of faith, what we have just sang, Lord, and yet it should be profoundly true in each one of us. You love us. We know you love us because your word tells us so. And Lord, that really is the heart of our faith. We believe you. We trust you. We feel your love. We feel your leading in our life as we seek to stand firm upon the word of God and as we seek to go forward in faith and obedience to you, all the time knowing, Jesus, you love us. What a great gift that is. We thank you for it. It's in your beautiful name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. We have one more thing to do before we leave this morning. This has almost become a a regular part of our services now, which is uh, kind of exciting to say over the last month. But today, again, we we get the opportunity to celebrate God's goodness in our church by growing our church membership yet again. As I've shared with you many times before, and I'll put before you again, we believe that church membership is a covenant between a local church and and a Christian with the church committing to spiritual oversight, discipleship, and care for the Christian, and the Christian committing to serving, submitting to, and investing in the local church and its mission. 
This morning, we have the joy of celebrating two more membership commitments being made. Jeremy and Navita Olson, if you guys would come to the front this morning. This morning, they are before you to make a commitment to this local church. They're supporting and believing in our church's mission, which is to make disciples who are growing together in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and are proclaiming his gospel and glory as their personal mission. They're committing to following and submitting to the spiritual oversight of the leadership of this church, and they are committing themselves personally to pray for, support, and be involved with gathering and serving in our local church family. And that last part is something that they do so well already. If you don't know, every single week, Jeremy and Avita come and clean and prepare our facilities so that we can gather in the safety and the comfort. Uh, everything's disinfected and, and we're good to, to gather. All our precautions are taken and that's because of their hard work week in and week out. We're so grateful for that. They're up here today because not only do they want to serve, but they want to be invested fully in this local church body. They're wanting to obey the command of Scripture, which I read every time we have a membership commitment like this, is that as a Christian, you and I, we're all commanded to, to formally identify with a local church body and be under the spiritual oversight of the pastor that God has put in that place. It's what we're commanded to do in Hebrews 13, 17, where all Christians are told, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So this morning, they're saying, Lord, we want that. We want the advantage that comes with identifying with a group of people, with having that care of our souls entrusted to a local body of the church. And so as they commit to this body and to this command of Scripture, I commit to them as the pastor who God has ordained and brought here, placed here to live out my calling in 1 Peter 5, which tells me to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. So I make a commitment this morning. They make a commitment this morning. But church family, we as a body make a commitment this morning to them. We are committing to Jeremy and Navita today that we will provide discipleship and care and love for them. We will live out the words of Jesus himself given in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where he says, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We're making that commitment, that pledge to them this morning. If you're a member of this church this morning, would you stand with me to receive them into our membership and join me in praying over them? Wonderful. I'll invite the rest of you, even if you're not a member, stand with us this morning and let's pray together. The Lord would bless them and keep them and thank God for bringing them into our body. Father, we thank you so much for Jeremy and Navita. We thank you for their commitment that they are making this morning to join this church body in a formal way, to identify with us, to say, yes, this is the people of God that I know I have been called to be a part of. I've called to serve alongside. I've called to work on mission with Lord, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their great service to our church as they, they serve us faithfully week in and week out. Thank you for their commitment to be part of the gatherings of this body. Lord, we pray that you would richly and powerfully bless them, Lord, as we move forward as a whole church, seeking to accomplish the mission of spreading your gospel, the glory of your name throughout all of Northeast Missouri here, Lord. Would you bless them as they join with us in that endeavor. Bless us, Lord, as we work side by side to see your glory spread, your fame made known. We thank you for them. We pray that you would bless them and bless us, Lord, as we seek you here week by week. It's in your powerful name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. amen.